Good morning. My name is Daryl Wahlberg, and as you can see by my little lapel pin right there, JW.org, the finest website ever created. In fact, I believe that Jehovah God gave mankind the internet just specifically for that website. That's right, for JW.org. That's why Jehovah God gave it. Uh, I just wanted to comment that I see that the dweebs, homosexuals, jerky boy nightmare theater have removed their videos. Their video is the one. Uh, it was a ridiculous video. They were dressed in clown face and mask. See, these, these apostates, for the most part, that are on here hiding behind false IDs, they're cowards. They're morons. They're idiots. And, and that's right, they're cowards. They can't even come out in their own names and stuff. They have to use uh, false IDs, and they hide their faces with masks and whatever. They have this mask fetish like these two homosexuals have. And they're obviously in man love because they're hanging out together all the time, and they're doing things together. And they're promoting each other. And they're very young. I'm sure their parents are quite proud of them. Without further ado, let's get into the questions. What is the Book of Life, and how can my name be written in it and kept there? Various Bible texts indicate that Jehovah God has a book or a scroll listing faithful persons who are in line to receive everlasting life, whether in heaven or on earth. From the heavens, the true God notes humans who manifest faith, meriting his approval and remembrance. We read concerning some Jews in Malachi's day, at that time, those in fear of Jehovah spoke with one another. And Jehovah kept paying attention and listening. And a book of remembrance began to be written up before him for those in fear of Jehovah and for those thinking upon his name. Malachi 3.16 Evidently, from the time of Abel forward, God has been noting, as if writing down in a book, those in the world of savable mankind who should be remembered as to everlasting life. Matthew 23, 35, Luke 11, 50, and 51. Anointed Christians, too, have their names in, his, in this book of life, or book of remembrance, for receiving everlasting life, and for them... It will be a heavenly life. Philippians 3, 14 and verse 20 and Philippians 4, 3. In contrast, Revelation 17, 8 says of those who wander admiring over the wild bees, their names have not been written in the scroll of life from the founding of the world. That be you. A person's being noted with remembrance and approval having his name in the book of life does not mean that he is guaranteed eternal life, as if this were predestined or unchangeable. Concerning the Israelites, Moses asked Jehovah, Now, if you will pardon their sin, and if not, wipe me out, please, from your book that you have written. God replied, Whoever has sinned against me, I shall wipe him out of my book. Exodus 32:32. Yes, even after God listed someone with approval in his book, the individual could become disobedient or abandon his faith. If that developed, God would blot out his name from the book of life, Revelation 3, 5. And this is obviously a figurative book, the mind of, in the mind of God. God doesn't literally have a book he writes people's names. On the other hand, if our names are now in God's book of life or in book of remembrance, we ought to continue exercising faith. But you didn't. You left God. And that way, we will keep our names there. You want your name back in that book? It starts worshiping Jehovah God again. Similarly, as persons are raised in the coming resurrection of the unrighteous, they will have the opportunity to exercise faith and hence qualify to have their names recorded in that book, Acts 24, 15. Finally, individuals so written down will be able to keep their names there 
permanently. That is true of the anointed as they prove themselves faithful even to death. Revelation 2.10, Revelation 3.5. As to those with earthly prospects, by proving faithful now down through Christ's millennial reign and then through the decisive test to follow, their names will become permanently written in the book of life. Revelation 20, 5 through 15. Yes. Are Jehovah and Jesus the ones men in Proverbs 30, verse 4, which ask, what is the name and what the name of his son? What is his name and what is the name of his son? This verse makes it evident how limited man is compared to the Most High. Its rhetorical questions could be asked about any man, but these questions should lead a reasoning person to the Creator. Let's check that out. Proverbs 30 and verse 4. Please turn with me there in your Bibles. And again, I'm posting here from the right here, reciting here from the New. Who has ascended to heaven and then descended? Only one. Who has gathered the wind in the palms of both hands and controlled the weather? Who has established all the ends of the earth? Only one. What is his name and the name of his son, if you know? You see, Jehovah is credited with doing all the miracles that Jesus performed while on the earth. And all the miracles ever performed from Noah on, or from Moses on. Jehovah did the miracles. He just used angels and men to perform them. So when it says, what is his name and what is the name of his son? What is his name and the name of his son? What is the name and the name of his son? It's very simple. His name is Jehovah, and his son's name is Jesus, <laughs> Michael, in heaven. This verse makes it evident how limited man. The writer, Agar, asked, Who has ascended to heaven that he may descend? Who has gathered the wind in the hollow of both hands? Who has wrapped up in the waters in a mantle? Who has made all the ends of the earth to rise? What is his name? And what the name of his son, in case you know, Proverbs 31 and 4. No imperfect human has gone up to heaven and come back omniscient. Neither or nor has any human the ability to control the wind, the seas, or geological forces shaping the earth. In effect, then Agar asks, do you know the name or family line of any man who has done these things? We must answer no. Job 38.1, 42.3. Job 38.1 through 42, verse 3. Isaiah 40.12 through 14. Jeremiah 23.18 and 1 Corinthians 2.16. Thus, we have to look outside the human sphere to find one who has the superhuman power to control natural forces. We are not, though, limited to learning about him by observing his accomplishments, Romans 1.20. Let's turn there, please, in our Bibles to Romans. And we're going to consider uh, verses 20 through 24. I love this. 23, I think, yeah, verses 20 through 23. I love these verses here because this clearly shows you that Jehovah God knew that evolution was going to appear on the scene. And this is a direct slap in the face to the evolutionist. Please, listen to these verses carefully. For his, God's, Invisible qualities are clearly seen from the world's creation onward because they are perceived by the things made. Even his eternal power and godship so that they are 
inexcusable for although they knew God, the evolutionists, they did not glorify him as God, nor did they thank him, but they became empty-headed in their reasonings, and their senseless hearts became darkened. Although claiming they were wise, they became foolish, and turned the glory of the incorruptible God into something like the image of corruptible man, and birds, and four-footed creatures, and reptiles. See, they're telling the kids today that we came from reptiles. We came out of a soup. Where's the soup? <laughs> this is because, as it were, descended from information about himself and his dealings. He has proved specific information. He did this, for example, when he descended to give the law to Moses on Mount Sinai, Exodus 19.20, Hebrews 2.2. He also uh, has helped his servants to appreciate his meaningful name, Jehovah. His name means God. he causes to be gone. Exodus 3, 13, 14, 6, 3. Later, he identified his son who was named Jesus and who literally descended from heaven with additional information about the Creator. John 1, 1 through 3, 14, and 18. This should help all of us reach certain conclusions. Like Agar, we cannot f from our own resources gain true wisdom. Proverbs 32 and 3. And, and we cannot name any human who has superlative powers of knowledge. Hence, we should humbly look to the one who is able to provide the wisdom we need. Child of God. This is the most holy one, whose name we can know and whose son has died so that we may might be ransomed and gained everlasting life. Matthew 20, 28. When, when on the stake, Jesus cried, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Did he lack faith? Believing that God had deserted him? Third and final question. Upon reading these words in Matthew 27, 46, or Mark 15, 34, some have concluded that when Jesus faced a painful death, his confidence in God wavered. Others have said that this was merely Jesus' human response, an understandable cry of desperation by a flesh and blood man in agony. There is good reason, though, to look beyond such human evaluations based on the surface appearances. While none of us today can know with certainty all that was involved in Jesus crying out as he did, we can note two likely motives. Jesus was well aware that he would have to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things and be killed. And on the third day, be raised up, Matthew 16, 21. In heaven, the Son of God have, had observed even imperfect humans experience torturous deaths while maintaining their integrity, Hebrews 11, 36 through 38. There just is no reason to believe that Jesus, a perfect human, would be seized with fear over what he faced. Nor would death on a stake suggest to him that his father had rejected him. Jesus knew in advance what sort of death he was about to die. That is, death by execution in hang on, on the last day. John 12, 32-33. He was sure, too, that on the third day he would be raised up. How then could Jesus say that God had forsaken him? First, he could have meant it in the qualified sense that Jehovah had taken away protection from his son so that Jesus' integrity would be tested to the utmost limit. A painful and shameful death. But God's releasing of Jesus to the wrath of enemies directed by Satan did not indicate total abandonment. Jehovah continued to show affection for Jesus, as provided on the third day when he raised up his son, which Jesus had known would occur, Acts 2.31-36, Acts 10.40, Acts 17.31. Connected to the foregoing is a likely second reason for Jesus' utterance while on the stake, that by using these words he could fulfill a prophetic indication about the Messiah. Hours earlier, Jesus told the apostles that things would happen just as it is written concerning him. Matthew 26, 24, Mark 14, 21. Yes, 
Jesus wanted to carry out the things that were written, including things in Psalm 22. You may find it revealing to compare Psalm 22, 7 and 8, Matthew 27, 39, 43, and Psalm 22, 15, John 19, 28, 29, Psalm 22, 16, Mark 15, 25, John 20, 27, and Psalm 22, 18, Matthew 27, 35, and Psalm 22 which gave so many prophetic indications of the Messiah's experiences, begins, My God, my God, why have you left me? Hence, when Jesus cried out as he did, he was adding to the record the prophecies that he fulfilled. Luke 24, 44. The psalmist did not believe that God had simply rejected or abandoned him, for David went on to say that he would declare God's name to his brothers, and he urged others to praise Jehovah. Psalm 22, 22, and 23. Similarly, Jesus, who knew Psalm 22 well, also had reason for confidence that his Father still approved of him and loved him, despite what God allowed him to experience on the stake. And Moses told the Israelites, the things revealed belong to us and to our sons to time indefinite. Deuteronomy 29, 29. Have these things revealed come to include the light that has been shed on God's Word during these last days? No. It would not be correct to put the understanding of prophecies that we have been granted during these last days on the same level of the things revealed that Moses was discussing. According to the context of Moses' words, the things revealed that he was talking about had to do with the Law Covenant. Deuteronomy 29-25. Moses showed that these things revealed carried responsibilities. Failure to live up to these responsibilities would cause Jehovah to discipline his people, which he did on many occasions. The Law Covenant, of course, was a re revelation from Jehovah God. It was prophesied, or it was preceded, rather, by other revelations to the patriarchs, to Noah, and going all the way back to heaven. Moses was used to put into writing the things revealed up to his time, and they have been preserved for us in the first five books of the, Pen of the Bible, normally called the Pentateuch, Talmud. Later, as the article, The Things Revealed Belong to Us, Washtar, May 15, 1986, explained, these things revealed came to include all the information recorded in the Bible, 2 Timothy 3.16. Thus, the Bible contains the sacred pronouncements of God, the things revealed by him, Romans 3, 2. When the natural Jews proved unfaithful, anointed Christians became the stewards of these things revealed, and the Christian congregation became a pillar and support for them, 1 Timothy 3, 15, 1 Corinthians 4, 1. Hence, members of that Christian congregation today can properly echo Moses' words that the things revealed belong to us. Today, Jehovah has shed much light on these things. As prophesied by Daniel, Jehovah's people have roved about in the inspired word and true knowledge has become abundant in Daniel 12, 4. Thus, we know now, or we now know, the identity of the other sheep. We recognize the great crowd. We see the fulfillment of the parable of the sheep and the goats. Such things have been disclosed or made known to us, but not in the sense of the things revealed as recorded in Jehovah's inspired word. Therefore, it would be correct to put such advances in understanding on the same level as the inspired revelations that make up the things revealed, recorded in the Bible. Rather, through an intensive study of the Bible, Jehovah's people have prayerfully sought a correct understanding of those things revealed. Jehovah, by means of Holy Spirit, has given that understanding to him in his own due time. The Bible tells us that the path of the righteous ones is like a bright light that is getting lighter and lighter until the day is firmly established, Proverbs 4.18. Jesus told the apostles of his time they couldn't handle all the truth. The increasing light 
that Jehovah has shed on the things revealed shows that day is getting closer and proves that his blessing is on the Christian congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses today. That's right. And you need to return. If you have left Jehovah, you need to get back, and you need to get back real soon. Time is running out for you. Make no bum about it. Time is running out for you. Yes. Please. <sighs> Come on back to Jehovah. You've left. All of you. Click on books and brochures, scroll down till you see Return to Jehovah, get that out and read it. Stop by a kingdom hall, find out what the hours are, get your butts back to the kingdom hall. It, it's serious. Time is running out for you, it really is. We are so close, even in this country now. We're so close to a civil war. It could be that because of what this president's doing, that he has to give all the authority to the United Nations. And what happens? Then the United Nations, in turn, will turn on organized false religion and completely burn her up with fire. And that begins the tribulation. Where are you going to be? when that happens. And, and make no doubt about it, it's going to happen. Thanks for watching this video, and there's more to come. Have a nice day.